Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 38, with our two books today, the Civil War Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman. And I read directly from the Civil War memoirs of Grant and Sherman. We start with Grant, and we're going to kind of flip-flop back and forth with both of these men these days. And so I'll identify what's Grant and what's Sherman as I'm reading our selections. So from the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, and I quote, Man proposes and God disposes. There are but few important events in the affairs of men brought about by their own choice. Although frequently urged by my friends to write my memoirs, I had determined to never do so, nor to write anything for publication. At the age of nearly 62, I received an injury from a fall which confined me closely to the house while it did not apparently affect my general health. This made study a pleasant pastime. Shortly after, the rascality of a business partner developed itself by the announcement of a failure. This was followed soon after by universal depression of all securities, which seemed to threaten the extinction of a good part of the income still retained, and for which I am indebted to the kindly act of friends. At this juncture, the editor of the Century magazine asked me to write a few articles for him. I consented for the money it gave me, for at that moment I was living upon borrowed money. The work I found congenial, and I determined to continue it. The event is an important one for me, for good or evil. I hope for the former. In preparing these volumes for the public, I have entered upon the task with a sincere desire to avoid doing injustice to anyone, whether on the national or confederate side other than the unavoidable injustice of not making mention often where special mention is due. There must be many errors of omission in this work because the subject is too large to be treated of it in two volumes in such a way as to do justice to all the officers and men engaged. There were thousands of instances during the rebellion of individual, company, regimental, and brigade deeds of heroism which deserve special mention and are not here alluded to. The troops engaged in them will have to look to the detailed reports of their individual commanders for the full history of those deeds. The first volume, as well as a portion of the second, was written before I had reason to suppose I was in critical condition of health. Later I was reduced almost to the point of death, and it became impossible for me to attend to anything for weeks. I have, however, somewhat regained my strength and am able often to devote as many hours a day as a person should devote to such work. I would have more hope of satisfying the expectation of the public if I could have allowed myself more time. I have used my best efforts with the aid of my eldest son, F.D. Grant, assisted by his brothers, to verify from the records every statement of fact given. The comments are my own and show how I saw the matters treated of whether others saw them in the same light or not. With these remarks, I present these volumes to the public, asking no favor but hoping they will meet with the approval of the reader. U.S. Grant, Mount McGregor, New York, July 1, 1885. And now switching to William T. Sherman from his own introduction to his own memoirs, Volume 1 and 2, and I quote, Another ten years have passed since I ventured to publish my memoirs, and being once more at leisure, I have revised them in the light of the many criticisms, public and private. My habit has been to note in pencil the suggestion of critics and to examine the substance of their differences, for critics must differ from the author to manifest their superiority. Where I have found material error, I have corrected, and I have added two chapters, one at the beginning, another at the end, both of the most general character and an appendix. 
I wish my friends and enemies to understand that I disclaim the character of a historian, but assume to be a witness on the stand before the great tribunal of history to assist some future Napier, Allison, or Hume to comprehend the feelings and thoughts of the actors in the grand conflicts of the recent past and thereby to lessen his labors and compilation necessary for the future benefit of mankind. In this free country, every man is at perfect liberty to publish his own thoughts and impressions, and any witness who may differ from me should publish his own version of facts and the truthful narration of which he is interested. I am publishing my own memoirs, not theirs, and we all know that no three honest witnesses of a simple brawl can agree on all the details. How much more likely will be the difference in a great battle covering a vast space of broken ground when each division, brigade, regiment, and even company naturally and honestly believes that it was the focus of the whole affair. Each of them won the battle, none ever lost. That was the fate of the old man who unhappily commanded. In this edition, I give the best maps which I know, which I believe to have ever been prepared, compiled by General O. M. Poe from personal knowledge and official surveys and what I chiefly aim to establish is the true cause of the results which are already known to the whole world. And it may be a relief to many to know that I shall publish no other, but like the player at cards will stand. Not that I have accomplished perfection, but because I can do no better with the cards in hand. Of omissions there are plenty, but of willful perversions of facts, none. In the preface to the first edition, in 1875, I used these words, and I quote, Nearly ten years have passed since the close of the Civil War in America, and yet no satisfactory history thereof is accessible to the public. Nor should any be attempted until the government has published and placed within the reach of students the abundant materials that are buried in the War Department at Washington. These are in the process of compilation, but at the rate of progress for the past ten years, it is probable that a new century will come before they are published and circulated, with full indexes to enable the historian to make a judicious selection of the materials. Unclose quote. Another decade has passed, and I am in possession of all these publications, my last being volume uh, 11, part 3, series 1, the last date of which is August 30th, 1862. I am afraid that if I assume again the character of prophet, I must extend the time deep into the next century and pray, meanwhile, that the official records of the war, Union and Confederate, may approach completion before the quote-unquote next war, or rather that we as a people may be spared another war until the last one is officially recorded. Meantime, the rising generation must be content with memoirs and histories compiled from the best sources available. In this sense, I offer mine as to the events of which I was an eyewitness and participant, or for which I was responsible. William T. Sherman, General, retired, St. Louis, Missouri, March 30th, 1885. Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. These were pairs of men that fought in the last great civil war that the United States experienced. And they are perfect examples of how there's nothing better in any enterprise, whether it's warfare or entrepreneurship, or government or nonprofits than a good number two. And every leader needs a good number two. If you're listening to me internationally and uh, you know very little about America, the United States of America, or about our history on this continent, uh, this podcast today is probably not going to help you. However, I encourage you to go Google, or look on Wikipedia, the details of the American Civil War, fought 1860 to 1865. Today we're going to focus on Grant and Sherman, 
and specifically we're going to narrow in not necessarily on their relationship on the battlefield at a broad level but we're going to narrow in on their relationship at one specific battle the battle of shiloh which occurred in 1862. the men who fought in the american civil war came from backgrounds that were predominantly rural in a way that many of us who have been raised in gentler more civilized and more technological times can barely imagine grant would ride his horse as a teenager and a young child uh, well over 40 miles to visit friends in other towns in ohio and in uh, northern kentucky and and Sherman, who was one of 10 children, would regularly work carpentry jobs and canal digging, beginning at the tender age of 12. These men came from hard times and hard backgrounds, or hard as defined by our modern era. And these two men, as a result of those backgrounds and their experiences at West Point and in the Mexican War. Yes, that's right. If you're not aware, the United States for a war against Mexico in the, I believe it was the 1840s, and people will correct me on that, but um, in the 1840s um, and acquired California, uh, acquired uh, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, uh, Nevada, uh, Colorado, uh, Utah, and of course <laughs> the great state of texas which by the way for a time was its own country these men these men represented at the time the best that american generalship could produce in their own era and they were also personally deeply flawed um, suffering from all of the maladies that we believe unique to our own modern age. Depression, anxiety, alcoholism, intemperance of mood, and on and on and on. By the time they met, the war had actually been carried on for a little while, and President Lincoln, tired of George B. McClellan's dithering with the Army of the Potomac, had to make a decision about Grant, the man of the West, uh, and whether or not he could be trusted with command of the entire Union Army. Now, following Grant's two-day battle at Shiloh in 1862, which resulted in the combined casualties of both Union and Confederate forces of 23,746 individuals, well, Alexander McClure, journalist historian and politician of philadelphia talked about the criticism that lincoln received after the two-day battle at shiloh where and we'll talk about this today the union folks the union troops were caught almost entirely completely by surprise uh, and so were grant and sherman mcclure records the critique that lincoln received in his own memoirs of the Civil War. And I quote directly from Alexander McClure, I appeal to Lincoln for his own sake to remove Grant at once. And in giving my reason for it, I simply voiced the admittedly overwhelming protest from the loyal people of the land against Grant's continuance in command. I could form no judgment during the conversation as to what effect my arguments had upon him, meaning Lincoln, beyond the fact that he was greatly distressed at this new complication. When I said everything that could be said from my standpoint, we lapsed into silence. Lincoln remained silent for what seemed a very long time. He then gathered himself up in his chair and said in a tone of earnestness that I shall never forget, I can't spare this man. He fights. Close quote. Sherman, for his part, upon meeting Grant about a year and a half before, said, and I quote, I am a damned sight smarter than Grant. I know a great deal more about war, military history, strategy, and grand tactics than he does. 
I know more about organization, supply, and administration and about everything else than he does. But I'll tell you where he beats me and where he beats the world. He don't care a damn for what the enemy does out of his sight, but it scares the hell out of me. Close quote. That ability to not really care about what the other guy is doing gave Grant a tactical advantage, as a matter of fact, and I don't have this included in my notes. Uh, there's an anecdote I remember reading many years ago um, about Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he was somewhat annoyed that people kept asking him, what's Robert E. Lee going to do? What's Robert E. Lee going to do? And what's Robert E. Lee going to do? And uh, he responded in his probably taciturn manner, I'm going to let Lee worry about what Lee's going to do, and I'm going to worry about what I'm going to do. That sums up Ulysses S. Grant, and this is not an uncommon thing to note about him. Um, was he an alcoholic? Yes. Was he a failed businessman? Yes. Was he a failed farmer? Absolutely. Was his marriage constantly on the edge of financial failure? Yes. War was the thing that animated him. And it was the same for Sherman. Sherman was never good at much of anything else, even teaching. And Sherman did teach for a while. Um, I believe he taught Greek and Latin and the classics at a, at a college and eventually wound up being in the administration of that college before the Civil War in the state of Louisiana. Yes, that's right. He was president of a college in the state of Louisiana on the eve of the Civil War. These two men had a relationship, and while that relationship was not always perfectly in sync, uh, even after the war, uh, you know, when Reconstruction and the Indian Wars in the West separated them over public policy and over what the president can and can't do. But in spite of all of that, in spite of all of the issues, in spite of all the problems between these two men, Sherman was Grant's reliable and steady number two. And Grant was Sherman's accountable and competent number one. And so on the podcast today, we're going to talk about the Battle of Shiloh. And we're going to talk about the memoirs of Grant and Sherman and how a leader can learn something from a 160-year-old war. Back to the Civil War, Civil War Memoirs of Grant and Sherman by Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman, where we're going to read a, a long selection here from, um, from Grant about what occurred during the run-up to the Battle of Shiloh. Um, and then we're going to follow that with <clears throat> Sherman's impressions of the run-up to the Battle of Shiloh. Um, now, just for your reference, um, the Battle of Shiloh occurred um, on April uh, 6th. Uh, yes, it was April 6th. Yeah, April 6th. <laughs> just checking my, checking my notes here. Um, April 6th uh, to April 8th, um, 1862, right, in, um, in, um, in a little town uh, and, uh, in, uh, in Tennessee. And this little town... Um, you know, sits at an interesting spot. And by the way, Shiloh means peace in Hebrew. It sits at an interesting spot there um, on the river, um, and it's, in, it's, a, it's a choke point for getting into deeper parts of the south or for advancing out of the south and moving west. Now, at the time in American history, um, the west wasn't what we think of the west as being today uh, the conception of the myth of the west was still there um, but native americans by the time the 1860s were rolling around um, had been gradually being moved from places like tennessee um, from places like the great smoky mountains um, and from places like ohio and had been moved out of that land 
and had been gradually being moved west. And of course, 20 years after the Civil War, eventually the Americans would show up to complete the movement of the native peoples into reservations. Now, that's a whole thing, a whole podcast in and of itself. The nature of whether that was correct or incorrect, the nature of what leadership looks like, and of course, uh, how do we conceptualize that in an American context? We're not going to talk about that today, but just know that during the course of the Civil War, uh, Vicksburg was considered to be the West, right? Vicksburg, Mississippi was considered to be the West. And so um, Grant had the army of Vicksburg at the time, and Sherman was his brigadier general. And I quote from the Civil War memoirs from General Sherman. I'm sorry, not General Sherman, General Grant. So we're going to start with Grant, and they're going to move into Sherman. And I quote, on the 5th, General Nelson, with a division of Buell's army, arrived at Savannah, and I ordered him to move up the east bank of the river to be in a position where he could be ferried over Crump's Land, over to Crump's Landing or Pittsburgh as occasion required. I learned that General Buell himself would be at Savannah the next day and desired to meet me on his arrival. Affairs at Pittsburgh Landing had been, for several, had been such for several days that I did not want to be away during the day. I determined, therefore, to take a very early breakfast and ride out to meet Buell and thus save time. He arrived on the evening of the 5th, but had not advised me of that fact, and I was not aware of it until some time after. While I was at breakfast, however, heavy firing was heard in the direction of Pittsburgh Landing, and I hastened there, sending a hurried note to Buell, informing him of the reason why I could not meet him at Savannah. On the way of the river, I directed the dispatch boat running close to running close to Crump's Landing so that I could communicate with General Lou Wallace. Uh, by the way, a side note, Lou, Ro Lou Wallace, much later on, um, wrote the book Ben-Hur, A Story of the Christ. Uh, back to the Civil War memoirs. I found him waiting on a boat, apparently expecting to see me. I directed him to get his troops in line ready to execute any orders he might receive. He replied that his troops were already under arms and prepared to move. Up to that time, I had felt no, by no means certain that Crump's Landing might be the point of attack. On reaching the front, however, about 8 a.m., I found that the attack on Pittsburgh was unmistakable and that nothing more than a small guard to protect our transports and stores was needed at Crump's. Captain Baxter, a quartermaster on my staff, was accordingly directed to go back and order General Wallace to march immediately to Pittsburgh by the road nearest river. Captain Baxter made a memorandum of this order. About 1 p.m., not hearing from Wallace and being much in need of reinforcements, I sent two more of my staff, Colonel McPherson and Captain Rowley, to bring him up with his division. They reported finding him marching towards Purdy, Bethel, or some other point west from the river and farther from Pittsburgh by several miles than when he started. The road from his first position to Pittsburgh landing was directed near the river. Between the two points, a bridge had been built across Snake Creek by our troops, at which Wallace's command had assisted expressly to enable the troops at the two places to support each other in case of need. Wallace did not arrive in time to take part in the first day's fight. General Wallace has since claimed that the order delivered to him by Captain Baxter was simply to join the right of the army and that... Uh, the road over which he marched would have taken him to the road from Pittsburgh to Purdy, where it crosses Owl Creek on the right of Sherman. But this is not where I had ordered him, nor where I wanted him to go. I never could see and do not now see why any order was necessary further than to direct him to come to Pittsburgh Landing without specifying by what route. His was one of the three veteran divisions that had been in battle, and his absence was severely felt. Later in the war, General Wallace would have made would not have made the mistake that he committed on the 6th of April, 1862. I presume his idea was that by taking the route he did, he would be able to come around on the flank or the rear of the enemy and thus perform an act of heroism that would redound to the credit of his command as well as to the benefit of his country. So two or three miles from Pittsburgh Landing was a log meeting house called Shiloh. It stood on the ridge which divides the waters of Snake and Lick Creeks, the former emptying into Tennessee, just north of Pittsburgh Landing, and the latter south. This point was the key to our position and was held by Sherman. His division was at that time wholly raw, no part of it ever having been in an engagement, but I thought this deficiency was more than made up by the superiority of the command. 
McClernand was on Sherman's left with troops that had been engaged at Forts Henry and Donaldson and were therefore veterans so far as Western troops had become such at that stage of the war. Next to McClernand came Prentiss with a raw division and on the extreme left, Stuart with one brigade of Sherman's division. Hurlbut was in the rear of Prentiss, massed, and in reserve at the time of onset. The division of General C.F. Smith was on the right, also in reserve. General Smith was still sick in bed at Savannah, but within hearing of our guns. His services would no doubt have been of inestimable value had his health permitted his presence. The command of his division was, devoted, was devolved upon Brigadier General W.H.L. Wallace, a most estimable and able officer, a veteran too, for he had served a year in the Mexican War and had been in command they had been with his command at Henry and Donaldson. Wallace was mortally wounded in the first day's engagement, and with the char change of commanders, thus necessarily affected in the heat of battle, the efficiency of his division was much weakened. The position of our troops made a continuous line from Lick Creek on the left to Owl Creek, a branch of Snake Creek on the right, facing nearly south and possibly a little west. The water in all these streams was very high at the time and contributed to protect our flanks. The enemy was compelled, therefore, to attack directly in front. This he did with great vigor, inflicting heavy losses on the national side, but suffering much heavier on his own. The Confederate assaults were made with such a disregard for losses uh, on their own side that our line of tents soon fell into their hands. The ground on which the battle was fought was undulating, heavily timbered with scattered clearings, the woods giving some protection to the troops on both sides. There was also considerable underbrush. A number of attempts were made by the enemy to turn our right flank, where Sherman was posted, but every effort was repulsed with heavy losses. But the front attack was kept up so vigorously that, to prevent the success of these attempts uh, to get on our flanks, the national troops were compelled several times to take positions to the rear near Pittsburgh Landing. When the firing ceased at night, the national line was all of a mile in the rear of the position it had occupied in the morning. Close quote. And now from William T. Sherman. And I quote Lieutenant Colonel McPherson of General C.F. Smith's, or rather General Halleck's staff, returned with me on the 16th of March. We disembarked and marched out about 10 miles towards Corinth to a place called Monterey or Pea Ridge, where the rebels had a cavalry regiment, which of course decamped on our approach, but from the people we learned that trains were bringing large masses of men from every direction into Corinth. McPherson and I reconnoitered the ground well and then returned to our boats. On the 18th, Hurlbut disembarked his division and took a post about a mile and a half out, near where the roads branched, one leading to Corinth and the other towards Hamburg. On the 19th, I disembarked my division and took a post about three miles back, three of the brigades covering the roads to Purdy and Corinth, and the other brigades, Stewart's, temporarily at a place on the Hamburg Road near Lake Creek Ford, where the Bark Road came into the Hamburg Road. Within a few days, Prentice's division arrived and camped on my left, and afterward, McClernand's and W.H.L. Wallace's divisions, which formed a line to our rear. Lou Wallace's division remained on the north side of Snake Creek, on a road leading from Savannah or Cramps Landing to Purdy. General C.F. Smith remained back at Savannah in chief command, and I was only responsible for my own division. I kept pickets well out on the roads and made myself familiar with all the ground inside and outside my lines. My personal staff was composed of Captain J. H. Hammond, Assistant Adjunct, Adjutant General, Surgeons Hartshorn and Le Homendieu, Lieutenant Colonels Haskell and Sanger, Inspector Generals, Lieutenants McCoy and John Taylor, A's de Camp. Uh, we were all conscious that the enemy was collecting at Corinth, but in what force we could not know, nor did we know what was going on behind us. On the 17th of March, General U.S. Grant was restored to the command of all the troops up the Tennessee River by reason of General Smith's extreme illness and because he had explained to General Halleck satisfactorily his conduct after Donaldson, and he too made his headquarters at Savannah but frequently visited our camps. I always acted on the supposition that we were an invading army, that our purpose was to move forward in force, make a lodgment on the Memphis and Charleston Road, and thus repeat the grand tactics of Fort Donaldson by separating the rebels in the interior from those at Memphis and on the Mississippi River. We did not fortify our camps against an attack because we had no orders to do so, and because such a course would have made our raw men timid. The position was naturally strong, with Snake Creek on our right, a deep, bold stream with a, content, with a confluent, Owl Creek, to our uh, right front, and Lick Creek with a similar confluent on our left, thus narrowing the space uh, over which we would be attacked to about a mile and a half or two miles. 
At a later period of the war, we could have rendered this position impregnable in one night, but at this time we did not do it, and it may be as well we did not. From about the 1st of April, we were conscious that a rebel cavalry on our front was getting bolder and more saucy. And on Friday, the 4th of April, it dashed down and carried off one of our picket guards, composed of an officer and seven men, posted a couple of miles out on the Corinth Road. Colonel Buckland sent a company to its relief, then followed himself with a regiment, and fearing lest he might be worsted, I called out his whole brigade and followed some four or five miles when the cavalry in advance encountered artillery. I then, after dark, drew back to our lines and reported the fact by letter to General Grant at Savannah. But thus far we had not positively detected the presence of infantry, for cavalry regiments generally had a couple of guns along, and I suppose the guns that opened on the evening of Friday, April 4th, belonged to the cavalry that was hovering along our whole front. Saturday passed in our camps without any unusual event, the weather being wet and mild and the roads back to the steamboat landing being heavy with mud. But on Sunday morning, the 6th, early, there was a good deal of picket firing, and I got breakfast, rode out along my lines, and about 400 yards to the front of Appler's regiment, received from some bushes in a ravine to the left front a volley, which killed my orderly, Holiday. About the same time, I saw the rebel lines of battle in front coming down on us as far as the eye could reach. All my troops were in line of battle ready, and the ground was favorable to us. I gave the necessary orders to the battery, waterhouses, attached to Hildebrand's brigade, and cautioned the men to reserve their fire till the rebels had crossed the ravine of Owl Creek and had begun the ascent. Also, sent staff officers to notify Generals McClernand and Prentiss of the coming blow. Indeed, McClernand had already sent three regiments to the support of my left flank, and they were in position when the onset came. In a few minutes, the Battle of Shiloh began with extreme fury and lasted two days. Its history has been well given, and it has been made the subject of a great deal of controversy. Hildebrand's brigade was soon knocked to pieces, but Buckland's and McDowell's kept their organization throughout. Stewart's was driven back to the river and did not join me in person till the second day of the battle. That was a long piece there, but I wanted to set up the Battle of Shiloh. Um, and if you go look at a map, and we will have a, a link in the show notes to uh, a Civil War history site where you can go look at the map of the Battle of Shiloh and you can see sort of how how pinched the, the national or the Union troops were and then how the Confederates advanced in order to take their position. You realize from looking at the Battle of Shiloh, and again, this is an example of Grant and Sherman, maybe not necessarily working as a team directly as they would much later um, with Sherman's march to the sea. I, I, I shouldn't say much later, much more intentionally later as they would in Sherman's march to the sea and some other events that occurred that hastened the end of the Civil War. This is an example of two men who exhibited two different types of thinking. Now, these men were talented, they were conscientious, they were sober, they were analytical, um, and they were even well prepared. And they still made all the wrong decisions at the Battle of Shiloh. Now, the thing about warfare is this, you can make wrong decisions all day, but if your enemy makes more wrong decisions than you do, you win. And that's how a lot of things work in life, actually. Uh, but in our post-Darwinian scientific age, we struggle with the notion that leaders, with all of the information that they have at their disposal, can be wrong when making decisions that they believe to be the right ones. Instead, when they make those wrong decisions, we castigate them and we Monday morning quarterback 
well, the reason why they're making those wrong decisions. Uh, I don't know what the psychological term is. I'm sure there is a psychological bias there, some sort of dissonance there. But the reason why at an intellectual level they're making these wrong decisions is because, well, there's a dichotomy that exists at the intersection between tactical and strategic between tactical thinking and strategic vision. So if you want to think about it this way, use this example. Tactical thinking is what gets you up in the morning to brush your teeth and let the dog outside. But strategic thinking is what helps you align your whole day with the practical set of goals and a vision of where you want your day to end up. Most people, not most leaders, most people in general struggle with day-to-day -day decision making wrapped up as they often are in either overestimating the impact of their tactical decisions, thus giving them strategic weight, and then underestimating their overall strategic vision, and thus reducing what might be laudable goals for the day to the level of nothing more than a meaningless speck. The Battle of Shiloh is an example of such a disconnect. Grant and Sherman both understood the basic tactical moment of Shiloh, which was to win the battle, right? To drive back the Confederate troops, to hold that position and to inflict damage. But the practical execution of the battle, the ferocity of the Confederate soldiers, as, uh, as, as, as Sherman wrote, they were saucy, right? <laughs> the sauciness of the Confederate soldiers, the nature of the the, the fog of war type of decision making that occurred during the battle, all of that culminated in and it served to shift the strategic focus of both Grant and Sherman over subsequent years away from merely beating the South honorably in battle, which, by the way, everybody up until 1862 in the North believed that this was just going to kind of be a pat on the back gentleman's war. The strategic thinking shifted from that to more of a brutal 20th century type perspective where, as Sherman would intone much earlier and then be prophetic, where war would actually be cruelty and that there would be no cure for it. Well, the full cruelty of war would be visited on the South, on the Southern states, and it would be visited through Grant wielding the tool of Sherman in a strategic way to crush the southern apparatus that even considered making war in the first place. The Battle of Shiloh is important to understand for leaders because after that battle, the outcome the 24,000 people dead, still the most blood, the bloodiest battle fought on the North American continent, still, even to this day. The, the, that, the outcome of that battle so horrified pundits, politicians, and the public, both in the North and the South, that Sherman's march to the sea, which was a tactical stroke of genius as well, was now even open to being considered and supported by a Lincoln administration that was in 1862, 1863, and 1864, particularly in 1863 and 1864, an administration that was being pushed on by the headwinds of a northern population that was sick and tired of war, sound familiar, and had nominated a Democrat to run against Lincoln, the Republican, named George McClellan, the former head of the U.S. Army at the Potomac and a dithering, piss-poor strategic thinker, if I ever read about one. It is difficult now, almost 160 years away from the Civil War, to appreciate the lessons of this war as leaders. It seems as though in our brains it's faded into sort of a Ken Burns, sepia-toned sort of past for us. But the Civil War, honestly, was a proto-example of what would later happen in the European wars of World War I and what would happen to the Americans much later on in the black and white and increasingly colorized World War II. Leaders 
need to take from the Civil War. Um, some strong lessons, particularly from the Battle of Shiloh. Strong lessons about having a good number two. Strong lessons about humility in the face of decision making. And of course, strong lessons about tactical and strategic thinking, because very little has changed in the deceitful dark heart of man that even serves to deceive the mind of man himself. Back to the book, back to the Civil War Memoirs of Grant and Sherman by Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman. By the way, here's an interesting side note. We are almost as far away in time. Actually, we are currently in our year of the Lord, 2022. We are as far away historically from World War II as the people who fought in World War II were historically far away from folks who fought in the Civil War. And for folks who fought in World War II, the Civil War seemed ancient black and white history. Just like for us, the folks who fought in World War II now seem like ancient black and white history. Back to the book from... The Civil War Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant still focused on the Battle of Shiloh. And I, and I quote, During the second day of battle, I had been moving from right to left and back to see for myself the progress made. In the early part of the afternoon, while riding with Colonel McPherson and Major Hawkins, then my chief commissary, we got beyond the left of our troops. We were moving along the northern edge of a clearing very leisurely toward the river above the landing. There did not appear to be an enemy on our right until suddenly a battery with musketry opened, up, opened upon us from the edge of the woods on the other side of the clearing. The shells and balls whistled about our ears very fast for about a minute. I do not think it took us longer than that to get out of range and out of sight. In the sudden start we made, Major Hawkins lost his hat. He did not stop to pick it up. When we arrived at a perfectly safe position, we halted to take an account of damages. McPherson's horse was panting as if ready to drop. On examination, it was found that a ball had struck him forward of the flank just back of the saddle and had gone entirely through. In a few minutes, the poor beast dropped dead. He had given no sign of injury until we came to a stop. A ball had struck the metal scabbard of my sword just below the hilt and broken it nearly off. Before the battle was over, it had broken off entirely. There were three of us. One had a horse, one had lost a horse, killed, one a hat, and won a sword scabbard. All were thankful it was no worse. After the rain of that night, before and the frequent and heavy rains uh, for some days previous, the roads were almost impassable. The enemy, carried, the enemy carried his artillery and supply chains over them in his retreat, made them still worse for troops following. I wanted to pursue, but had not the heart to order the men who had fought desperately for two days, lying in the mud and rain whenever, not fighting, and I did not feel disposed um, to positively order Buell or any part of his command to pursue. Although the senior in rank at the time, I had only been so a few weeks. Buell was and had been for some time past department commander, while I commanded only a district. I did not meet Buell in person until too late to get the troops ready and pursue with effect, but I had seen him at the moment of last charge. I should have at least requested him to follow. Note from Grant. In an article on the Battle of Shiloh, which I wrote for the Century Magazine, I stated that General A. McD. McCook, who commanded a division of Buell's army, expressed some unwillingness to pursue the enemy on, March, on Monday, April 7th, because of the condition of his troops. General Badeau, in his history, also makes the same statement on my authority. Out of justice to General McCook and his command, I must say that they left a point 22 miles east of Savannah on the morning of the 6th. From the heavy rains of a few days previous and the passage of trains and artillery, the roads were necessarily deep in mud, which made marching slow. 
The division had not only marched through this mud the day before, but it had been in the rain all night without rest. It was engaged in the battle of the second day and did as good a service as its position allowed. In fact, an opportunity occurred for it to perform a conspicuous act of gallantry, which elicited the highest commendation from division commanders in the Army of the Tennessee. General Sherman, both in his memoirs and report, makes mention of this fact. General McCook himself belongs to a family which furnished many volunteers to the Army. I refer to these circumstances with minuteness because I did General McCook injustice in my article in the century, though not to the extent one would suppose from the public press. I am not willing to do anyone an injustice, and if convinced that I have done one, I am always willing to make the fullest admission. I rode forward several miles a day after the battle and found that the enemy had dropped much, if not all, of their provisions, some ammunition, and the extra wheels of their caissons, lightening their loads to enable them to get off their guns. About five miles out, we found their field hospital abandoned. An immediate pursuit must have resulted in the capture of a considerable number of prisoners and probably some guns. Shiloh was the severest battle fought at the West during the war, and but a few in the East equaled it for hard, determined fighting. I saw an open field in our possession on the second day, over which the Confederates had made repeated charges the day before, so covered with the dead that it would have been possible to walk across the clearing in any direction, stepping on bodies, stepping on dead bodies, without a foot touching the ground. On our side, National and Confederate troops were mingled together in about equal proportions, but on the remainder of the field, nearly all were Confederates. On one part, which had evidently not been plowed for several years, probably because the land was poor, bushes had grown up, some to the height of eight or ten feet. There was not one of these left standing unpierced by bullets. The smaller ones were all cut down. Contrary to all my experience up to that time and to the experience of the army I was then commanding, we were on the defensive. We were without entrenchments or defensive advantages of any sort, and more than half the army engaged the first day was without experience or even drill as soldiers. The officers with them, except the division commanders and possibly two or three of the brigade commanders, were equally inexperienced in war. The result was a Union victory that gave the men who achieved it great confidence in themselves ever after. The enemy fought bravely, but they had started out to defeat and destroy an army and capture a position. They failed in both, with very heavy loss in killed and wounded, and must have gone back discouraged and convinced that the Yankee was not an enemy to be despised. And now the words of William Tecumseh Sherman on the Battle of Shiloh from Civil War Memoirs of Sherman and Grant. General Grant did not make an official report of the Battle of Shiloh, but all its incidents and events were covered in the reports of division commanders and subordinates. Probably no single battle of the war gave rise to such wild and damaging reports. It was publicly asserted at the North that our army was taken completely by surprise, that the rebels caught us in our tents, bayoneted the men in their beds, that General Grant was drunk, that Buell's opportune arrival saved the Army of Tennessee from utter annihilation, etc., these reports were in measure sustained by the published opinions of Generals Buell, Nelson, and others who had reached the steamboat landing from the east just before nightfall of the 6th, when there was a large crowd of frightened, stampeded men who clamored and declared that our army was all destroyed and beaten. Personally, I saw General Grant, with, who with his staff visited me about 10 a.m. of the 6th, when we were desperately engaged. But we had checked the headlong assault of our enemy and then held our ground. This gave him great satisfaction, and he told me that things did not look as well over on the left. He also told me that on his way up from Savannah that morning, he had stopped at Crump's Landing and had ordered Lew Wallace's division to cross over Snake Creek, so as to come up on my right, telling me to look out for him. He came again just before dark and described the last assault made by the rebels at the ravine near the steamboat landing, which he had repelled by a heavy battery collected under Colonel J.D. Webster and other officers, and he was convinced that the battle was over for that day. He ordered me to be ready to assume the offensive in the morning, saying that, as he observed at Fort Donelson, as he had observed at Fort Donelson, at the crisis of the battle, both sides seemed defeated, and whoever assumed the offensive was sure to win. General Grant also explained to me that General Buell had reached the bank of the Tennessee River, opposite Pittsburgh's landing, and was in the act of ferrying his troops across at the time he was speaking to me. 
about a half hour after General Buell himself, about a half an hour afterward, General Buell himself rode up to where I was, accompanied by Colonels Fry, Mickler, and others of his staff. I was dismounted at the time, and General Buell made of me a good many significant inquiries about matters and things generally. By the aid of a manuscript map made by myself, I pointed out to him our positions as they had been in the morning and our then positions. I also explained that um, my right then covered the bridge over Snake Creek, by which we had all day been expecting Lew Wallace, that McClernand was on my left, Hurlbut on his left, and so on. But Buell said he had come up from the landing and had not seen our men, who of whose existence, in fact, he seemed to doubt. I insisted that I had 5,000 good men still left in line and thought that McClernand had as many more and that with what was left of Hurlbert's, W.H.L. Wallace's, and Prentice's divisions, we ought to have 18,000 men fit for battle. I reckoned that 10,000 of our men were dead, wounded, or prisoners and that the enemy's losses could not be much less. Beal said that Nelson's, McCook's, and Crittenden's divisions of his army, containing 18,000 men, had arrived and could cross over in the night and be ready for the next day's battle. I argued that with these reinforcements, we could sweep the field. Buell seemed to mistrust us and reportedly said he did not like the looks of things, especially about the boat landing. And I really feared he would not cross his army that night lest he should become involved in our general disaster. He did not, of course, understand the shape of the ground and asked me for the use of my map, which I lent him on the promise that he would return it. He handed it to Major Mickler to have it copied, and the original returned to me, which Mickler did two or three days after the battle. Buell did cross over that night, and the next day we assumed the offensive and swept the field, thus gaining the battle decisively. Nevertheless, the controversy was started and kept up, mostly to the personal prejudice of General Grant, who, as usual, maintained an imperturbable silence. Sometimes it's better, Pache Sherman, sometimes it's better just to shut up. In our vanity-driven world, the desire to personalize, to stand up and stand out and quote-unquote let your voice be heard, this is the rallying cry or the drumbeat from the culture around us as leaders. Grant gives us a different example. In a different time, not that far removed from the moment you're currently listening to this podcast in, leaders did believe genuinely that silence was the best policy until passions cooled and logic could prevail when the facts were known and circumstances could be conscientiously, logically, and carefully examined. This leads to leaders having gravitas, steadiness, quiet confidence. These character traits are hallmarks of leaders who had weight and want to have weight. And when they finally do speak, their followers and the audience actually listens. But there's discipline involved in this, right? A discipline that in our dopamine-driven current culture is not really uh, lauded too much, nor is it supported, nor is it encouraged. As a matter of fact, very often in many cases inside of organizations, silence is equated with cowardice or maybe ignorance or maybe fecklessness or venality. <sighs> This is a bad take. The discipline to be quiet and keep your powder dry, to avoid the instant hot take on the first report of bad news, whether it's public bad news or private bad news, and to have the talent differentiate between the history and the moment. These are the hallmarks of a leader who has absorbed all the old lessons of the 19th century generals, like Grant 
and Sherman. Heck, the guy we didn't talk about today, the guy who haunts both Grant and Sherman and stands head and shoulders above every other general in the Civil War, a guy you may know, Robert E. Lee. Well, he left the battlefield on the battlefield after he was done with the war and said very little about much of anything. Silence is not complicity. Silence is not venality. If you're a leader, silence is not violence. Silence is not compliance. Silence is the appropriate, very often, move when the question is what else needs to be said or does everyone here need to be heard from or what can we actually learn from shutting up leaders leaders know when to shut up So I, I barely covered a fraction of the Civil War memoirs. I mean, not even a fraction of a fraction of the Civil War memoirs of Grant and Sherman. And um, it's worth reading those memoirs. Um, and they come in at, at, at close to, well, anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the page count. They're very thick books. And uh, you can order them from Amazon. You can order them in finely leather-bound editions. Um, or you can order them in the way that I did, which are the larger paperbacks, right? Um, you can also investigate the memoirs and the and the and the study and the the um, the research um, around both Grant and Sherman as men um, online, and you can go and look at it, right, anytime you want. But this is 2022, right? And so, what can we take from this cursory? admitted cursory glance at the memoirs of William Sherman and Ulysses S. Grant. What can we apply to our own lives from these memoirs um, and from this war, the American Civil War, that put to death the concept of slavery in the United States of America, but it also opened up a whole other Pandora's box of snakes with which we are still dealing today. What can we learn from leader? What can we learn as leaders from these these generals, these men's actions that they did not take lightly, um, nor that they just shrugged off after the shooting was over? What can we learn from these memoirs, which are great books in and of themselves? I think the first thing that we can learn is that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Whether you like it or not, you got to believe in a transcendent thing, something that's at the top of the hierarchy, something that's bigger than you as a leader. Robert E. Lee believed that his loyalty to Virginia and thus his loyalty to the South was bigger than his loyalty to the, to the United States. General Grant believed that his loyalty to the United States was bigger than his loyalty to the concept of slavery. And by the way, he wasn't loyal to the concept of slavery. As a matter of fact, Grant had slaves and he actually freed them because he actually couldn't get them to work. Remember I said he was a piss poor farmer? That was part of the reason why. He could barely get himself to work, much less inveigle discipline or comply someone else based on the color of their skin. Okay. Grant believed that there was something that was higher than just that, higher than the system. Uh, Lee believed that there was something higher than the nation state. 
And of course, Lincoln believed that there was something higher than both of those things, the preservation of the nation state, the preservation of the union. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's Proverbs 9.10. When you read these memoirs, you do get the sense that these men feared the Lord. Maybe not your conception of the Lord, but they definitely feared the transcendent. They feared not necessarily what history would say about them, but they feared what God would say about them. It's important for leaders to have something above them in order to maintain their humility. I think the other thing that you can pick up from these memoirs is that every leader needs a good number two. Now, we kind of harped a little bit on that today, but, um, but it's true. You need a partner. You need somebody who's got your back, someone who will have your number, right? Uh, someone who sees your weaknesses but doesn't allow other people, either the competition or the enemy or whoever, to take advantage of those weaknesses, someone who's got your back. Now, typically, in the modern conception of this, we put partnerships in a business sense, or ridiculously, we call marriage a partnership, right? Marriage should be something deeper even than that, and I'm not going to touch on that today. But I will say in the business sense, if you could find someone who's a good number two, you hold on to them for dear life. And a good number two, someone who isn't nearly as bought in as you are on the passion of the thing, but is willing to watch your back as you pursue the passion you have for the thing, that person, well, that person's worth their weight in gold. Point number three, intentional leaders know that tactical thinking is rare, but there's been an even, there's historically been an even shorter supply of strategic vision. We need more leaders need more of the division between what is tactical and what is strategic and leaders need to be thinking strategically. What does your life look like as a leader 10 years from now? What's it going to look like five years from now? What's it going to look like a month from now? By the way, the month, that's tactical. The year, now you're getting closer to strategic. 10 years though, that's strategic thinking. Where do you want to be? What's the strategy? What's the goal? What's the outcome? And by the way, you can sometimes forget the goal while you're pursuing the strategy because your tactics can blind you to strategic vision. Intentional tactical thinking is rare, but for leaders, strategic vision has always been an even shorter supply. Finally, I think we get from Grant and Sherman that leaders maintain an imperturbable, to paraphrase from Sherman, silence. This is something that I've been trying to get across to my children for many years. Everything doesn't have to be commented on immediately or even all of the time. Some things can just be, and that's okay. We don't need a hot take. We don't need a constant stream of commentary and I the irony of me being on a podcast saying this is not lost on me sometimes silence is golden though but knowing when to be silent and when to speak knowing how much to say and what the words are knowing how to make those words land and when to launch them and when to hold them back well, this is the reason why Grant wrote his memoirs when he did, and it's also the reason why Sherman revised his memoirs. Taking in a critique from others, really thinking it through, taking time for it to, to, to sink in, and then reacting or responding. Or leader does. And... So I've been saying this month on the podcast, and I'll be saying it consistently for the next few months. We need more mature leaders. We need more adults in the room. And quite frankly, sometimes that adult shouldn't say a word at all. And well... 
That's it for me. Well, if you liked that video, you should check out more by subscribing to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast playlist here on the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel. You can also get a copy of my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation for Intentional Leadership, co-written with Bradley Madigan. Check that out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere where you get ebooks today. And thanks.